Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the 10th presentation of BA Slash. Um, if you are new to BA Slash, welcome again. And a quick introduction of myself. I'm Monique Ho. I work at BAE Systems Applied Intelligence as a management consultant. I help organizations with their digital products, innovation programs, cybersecurity operations, agile, that sort of interesting um, business things. And I started the, the BA Slash community last year. We also have Ellen, another organizer of BA Slash. Ellen, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Alan Wishart. Uh, I've been a BA for uh, probably 20 odd years, um, mainly in agile environments, um, but also in the old fashioned uh, waterfall, um, mainly in financial services, but also in um, loyalty marketing and automotive. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me really. Oh, that's, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. And um, actually today, or this time, um, we will do something different. So I know that most of you may have just started work. If you're abroad, you're not in the UK Council, or you have just finished work because you're in the UK or um, in the EU. So um, if you want to have something refreshing, we, we've got it for you. So let's do kind of an icebreaker. And if it's convenient for you, um, it will be great if you can switch on your, your webcam so everyone can meet one another and that would be really nice. And also you would actually need the camera to join the, the icebreaker. The, the icebreaker is called Guess the Occupation. So it's super fun, I, I promise. Um, it engages like everyone in the room and how it works is that we'll send two to three audience in a breakout room and the rest of us in the main room will come up with an occupation. So for example, um, athlete or um, synchronized swimmer or crazy scientist. And then we'll invite the two to three audience back to the main room and we'll use our body language and facial expression to act the, the occupation for them to guess what it is that we have decided as a room. So is it clear what, what we, we, we need to do in the, the next few minutes? Um, so yeah, so do we have any volunteers who want to, to guess the occupation? Or shall I pick people at random? <laughs> yeah, anyone? Let's go random. Cool. Yeah, okay, I'm going to open a break. I'll volunteer. Cool. I'll okay, volunteer. That's great. Excellent. We got Louise. Do you have another, maybe one more volunteer? I'll volunteer. All right, Yay. Thank you, Nick. So yeah, so Alan, if you could send. Um, then, hopefully this will. Yay. Um, you should have an invite to a breakout room, I think. Yeah, invite them to a breakout room, yeah. Excellent. Oh, cool. I think they've gone. <laughs> yeah. It's our time. Yay. So let's, let's decide. Um, any, any thoughts on what occupation we should go for? Hi Monique, sorry I joined late, so I kind of missed what we were doing. I, I know you said it's about guessing their occupation. Yeah, that's right. So the um, is a, an icebreaker. So we want um, the two audience in the breakout room to guess an occupation that as a as a collective here that we have decided. So so yeah. So now I think we've got like twenty odd people in in this main room. So let's come up with one occupation that we we are happy with. And then when we invite them back to this main room, we'll all be kind of showing kind of our, our nice action shot to tell them what the, the guest, like what the, the occupation is without saying a word. Okay, and that, so this is their occupation or are we just making up okay. an occupation? Let's come up with one. So it can okay. be farmer, right. lawyer, or more exciting, like other occupations, yeah. <laughs> So any thoughts? Phil, do you have any thoughts on? Why don't we go for circus juggler? That's a nice <laughs> easy one for us to all act out and, and have them thinking about. Yeah. Any any other thoughts? Astronaut maybe? 
Sorry, what's that again? Astronaut. Astronaut. Okay, cool. So we have uh, cir circus, juggler, and astronaut. Any, any other thoughts? I, I was about to say that along those lines, actually, we should add the uh, NASA Perseverance module okay. lander or something like that for okay. the <laughs> success this week. Cool. Yeah. So Topic maybe um, a quick shot of. Um, oh, they're back. Back. It feels like we've never been away. <laughs> oh. That was quite strange. <laughs> Since they're back, well, I'll, I'll just finish off the, the voting here. Um, num if you want to do kind of number one, put a, a thumb up. Um, in if you use the yeah, um, either. Um, show hands or the, the reaction, so we can just check, yeah. Or if you want to vote for number two, um, do a heart shake on the screen. Yeah, so let's have a look. I think we got more. We have only thumbs up and clap, that's it, right? Like as reactions. Oh, is it? There oh. is no heart, yeah. Oh, okay, so clap then for the second one, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's, maybe we got a different, yeah, I think we just marginally, maybe, I think it's a tie. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a tie. So, yeah. So, shall we practice run with the first one and then do the second one as the, the real test? <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, okay. You're going to do the easy one first. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's do number one together without saying a word. And Louise and Nick, you can guess. Cool. Okay. Let's let's go. One, two, three. Go. Fingers on buzzers, Nick. A juggler. <laughs> Circus. Oh. I was going to say driving instructor. <laughs> Speed. Cool. That's good. Cool. And shall we do have number two now? That will be um, a more interesting one. Uh. So yeah. So one, two. You, by the way, you can you can stand up to to do the action shot. Okay. One, two, three. Go. <laughs> It's uh, astronaut. Oh, oh, my God. God. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I thought Monique was doing Tai Chi. <laughs> I nearly said ballet dancer, so I'm glad I didn't say that. <laughs> A juggling astronaut would have been harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's got to be cheating, hasn't it? <laughs> That would be quite difficult to do. I think credit goes to Monique, like she acted very well. <laughs> uh, apparently, like, I, I don't know, I think last time when I did this icebreaker, we were doing synchronized swimmer. And I think it's just the audience, they, they guess really well. Like they were saying, like, oh, you, you did it really well. Like I, I just watched you and I knew like you were doing synchronized swimming. I was like, no. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> I was just... Is new um, lockdown <laughs> videos you've been watching? <laughs> yeah, but here you go. But yeah, but thank you for, for joining the, the icebreaker. I hope that's just kind of a, a refreshing thing to do. Yeah. To kickstart. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. And I would say, um, do you recommend you to, to keep the, the camera on? Um, it's always good to, to see faces. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, and if you like yay slash, um, please spread the word with your, your contact. Uh, tweet us, follow us on, on LinkedIn, and uh, we have a, a YouTube channel as well. We will put all these recording on, on YouTube, so you can always play back and kind of catch up, and, and you can share the, um, the recording with your, your colleagues as well. Yeah. I think it's also there's one thing that we have started to do is we've, um, we've got a Medium channel as well, which we haven't put on here yet. Um, but certainly uh, in our run up to Christmas, we, we put a lot of uh, content on Twitter and LinkedIn and we've kind of collated all of that and put it onto Medium. So it's uh, available for anyone that wants to uh, browse and read through. I think um, some people have found that quite useful. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And cool. And with those, so I move on. So um, just a few kind of housekeeping points. Um, you'll receive the, the slices and the recording of this session in a couple of days. And your line is kind of maybe muted now uh, because we are doing a, a recording. So feel free to, to unmute it um, towards the end when we have kind of a Q&A discussions and, and all these. And yeah, and do put your, your questions in the, the chat box. 
and so Alan will be uh, monitoring it and and ask questions towards the end and and all, as as I mentioned you can all also have talked about and ask questions directly as well don't necessarily need to to use the, the chat box but it's just kind of quite good to to capture it just in case yeah there are too many questions that we need to go through and we may forget one or two um, last but not least you are very welcome to stay behind for a couple more breakout uh, discussions and, and networking. So I'll, I'll hand over to, to Alan to introduce our, our speaker of today. So um, yeah, today we've, um, we've got Phil Fox. Uh, he's someone I've known for um, a number of years uh, and has always been a, a real advocate of um, agile methodology, um, really experienced um, across a number of industries, um, working now at Adaptivist, uh, looking after their customers. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, he said to me before, um, before this tonight that if you want to interact, um, use your um, reactions on Zoom and we'll uh, try and uh, break into um, the, uh, the presentation and, uh, and get Phil to answer your questions. If not, put them in the chat, I'll be monitoring them. Uh, and then we'll come back to uh, to your questions at the end and present them to Phil. Um, you know, I think you'll 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 realise that he's uh, he's got some really good observations and experience. So, you know, fill your boots, ask him anything, and uh, I'm sure he'll do his best to to give you a brilliant answer. So, over to you, Phil. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Molly. You all hear me okay? Brilliant. Um, so the first thing I'll say, the key message in this is agile. Agile is really important because the heat, the whole concept of agility is mm -hmm. if something doesn't work perfectly for you, change it. So everything that I'm going to run through today are just things that I've observed. Doesn't mean it will work in every scenario and it might not continue to work in any scenario. So just remember that it's all about reflections. And so this is me looking at what I've seen and what I've thought and what I've heard. And it's my personal viewpoint. And all of this is about making sure that I share that. Most importantly for today is giving you the opportunity to share your viewpoints as well. So let's start with a couple of little simple definitions. What do we understand a business analyst is responsible for? Well, I don't think anybody would argue with this list, but actually, one of the things that I would say is plan and document requirements is so old school these days. We communicate requirements. And let's face it, standing up and communicating those requirements, doing presentations, sharing information, are the way in which we do things these days. Videos, post-it notes, they're all ways of communicating. And that's one of the key skills that I would say a business analyst needs to have. And so what we're going to focus on today is these five key aspects of understanding the business requirements, communicating requirements, understanding how that requirement may be solved, recognizing the impact of change, and the acceptance testing. Now, every business analyst will look at that and say, yes, but I also do dot, dot, dot. And that's absolutely as it should be. And what we have to think about is, Business analyst is the person who truly understands the way in which the business operates, truly gets underneath the, the fine detail. But more importantly, when you work in an agile world, you have to sign up to the agile manifesto principles. What are they? And do they actually apply to business analysts? So let's run through, there are 12 principles. And I'm just gonna talk briefly to each one. The first one, everybody I'm sure would agree that delivering to the customer is your number one priority. Welcoming change. Those people who are still locked into delivering in a waterfall way, you actually have in a waterfall, there is often a reluctance to change. There is that almost that barrier that once you've gone down the route and you've got past that first step, change is actively discouraged. And change in that respect is very important that what you do is you make sure that when you gather change, that's recognized, it's welcomed, and it's part of that agile process. Change happens in the real world, so we just need to do that. Similarly, the agile one says, we deliver solutions frequently. We don't do this at 
the end. We deliver, we get feedback, and we deal with that. But a business analyst is a key interface to those business people. It's all about understanding the work that is required, the output, the outcome that you're trying to achieve. And if you work with motivated individuals, give them the environment, give them the support, they'll get on and they will solve your problems. Many people who've worked in a waterfall scenario and Alan and I share many experiences of the overnight sessions where everything is on that last release and you're all going to do it over this long weekend. And at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning, when it's all gone wrong and you're trying to fix it on the fly, it's not sustainable. And first reaction time. Okay, if you can just check that everybody's found where the reactions are. If you've suffered, suffered is a good word for it. If you've participated in some change of business, which has required you to work through the night, give us a, a thumbs up. Yeah, I'm seeing several reactions coming through, lots of people in that respect. And this is exactly what we would expect. And agility, because what it's about is about delivering small elements incrementally, it makes for a much more sustainable development because you don't get those big bang, lots of pressure on that day in that respect. So again, as business analysts, this is something we can sign up to. Working software, working solutions is your primary measure of success. It's not how much have you spent. It's not how far have you gone down somebody's checklist. It's not how far along the Gantt chart are you. It's does this problem be solved with what we're releasing? Now, I'm here and I'm talking to you. I'd love to be there in person with you for us to be sat around in a meeting room with a nice drink and me actually talking to you in person. But failing that, I'm doing face to face across Zoom. It's still an effective way of communicating. And it's far better than the 600 page requirements document that used to come out. And so we've got that in there. Now, remember, we want good solutions and feedback is a key part of that solution feedback. And so continuous attention to that helps us embrace that agility. I'm sure number 10 is something that will react with, will resonate with many of you out there. How many of you have done some work as a business analyst or as a project manager only for the project to be canned or for there to be a complete change of direction or for there to be a change of legislation or you name it, there's so many things that will hit. And again, give us a thumbs up if that's hit, happened to you. You've spent so much time working on something and then for whatever reason, that work is suddenly no longer required. And again, agility is about minimizing the impact of you doing work that doesn't get used. And so again, we can take that one off. Working in isolation doesn't really work for getting the best. What you need to do is bring together people from a different backgrounds, different experiences, and get them all to work together. And in that self-organizing team. And then the final number 12, Think about what you've done and how you're doing it and think, is there a better way? Is there some way we can do this better? It may be a small change. Um, one organization I worked for, we had an individual who just could not get up in the morning. He just really struggled. He was happy to work through late in the night. Um, so having to stand up at 9 a.m. every day just didn't work because he never got there on time. He just could not get up in the morning, no matter how many people talk to him, his manager talked to him, his manager's manager, etc. He was put on personal improvement plans. He just couldn't make it in for nine o'clock. It was just impossible. He just couldn't manage it with his home life. So what did the team do? They actually said, you know what? We recognize that. We recognize we're all individuals. We'll change the time of our stand-up from 9 a.m. We'll make it 5 p.m. and we'll do it as a roundup stand-up at the end of each day to prepare for the next day. All of a sudden, that meant that team was then cohesive and they were working as a team. He was appreciated that his circumstances were taken into account with his personal life and all the kids he had to get off to school. All of that was taken into account. Didn't make any difference to most people because whether you did it at the end of the day or at the start of the day, it's still set the same scene. And that's really important. That's a simple change that can actually make a team work so much better together. And that's an example. And so I think we can all agree that 
looking back and reflecting on what do we do and how can we do it better doesn't have to be necessarily about something that we're doing to deliver the solution. It can be anything in the way in which we work. And that friendship. A great little tool for you to do if you want to do a team building exercise is one called My User Manual. It's a great fun activity to do. It's a great thing to just sort of, as a team, many of you will be familiar with the Haynes User Manuals for, man, man, for repairing cars. Think of it as a very cut down version of that about how do people work best with you? What's your preferred method of communication? What time of day do you work best? Are you the sort of person who wants big picture first or are you a detailed driver? Think about what that is and share it in your team. It's a great way of looking at and adjusting your behavior as a team. So feedback time. What type of team do you folks mostly work in? Is it? Give us a, a round of applause if you follow an agile methodology and if you're still mostly using waterfall thumbs up and we'll just see what sort of split we've got across the audience i know some people will be in both and that's fine you can choose the reaction and the flick between the two if you want i'm happy with that so very quickly looking at the reactions where we're seeing a lot of people are agile already and we've got a few people who are putting the thumbs up for very much waterfall and that's exactly what i'd expect we we see this time and time again that folks are very much, there are lots of people who are still agile. Sorry, there are lots of people who have gone agile in some form, but there are still a lot of people for various reasons work in a waterfall. And that's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. People go, oh, you must be agile. Oh, waterfall is dead. No, there are times when each is right. Make sure you use the right methodology for the sort of thing you're doing. If you have to interact with lots and lots of partners and you have to tie in, Waterfall to make sure you identify those touch points is by far the better solution than, water, than Agile. Make sure you think about what you're doing, what are your interactions, what are your engagements, all of that is really important. So I'm now gonna give a couple of um, sort of mini use stories, mini use cases to help people. And I'm straight seeing some of the people writing their comments in. Please stick as much in the chat as you can. I'm not gonna keep looking at it while I'm presenting. Um, I'll rely on Monique and Alan to shout if there's something that I need to particularly pick up on. I'm going to talk through. So let's look at our next bit, the mass production line. OK, everybody has heard the story of the Model T Ford, the first production line of cars. Everybody has seen these pictures where you've got the pictures of the production line and all the robots running away, making a car. But what does that actually mean? And what does it mean to us when we think about agility? Well, there is a concept in Agile called tactile, T-A-K-T. And tactile can be considered in the same way as you have a measurable beat time, a heart rate, if you like. And what it's about is the time that it takes for a particular process to complete. And so here you can see the robots building Ford, Ford F-150 cars. And their tack time is 53 seconds, which basically means that every single process along that production line is aligned with that heartbeat of 53 seconds. And it means that at the end of the day, every 53 seconds or a multiple thereof, a new product rolls off the production line. So how does that relate to Agile? Well, you can improve individually the different steps in the process, but until you've completed all of the processes and reduced them all to 52 seconds, you can't actually improve that tack time. But you might be able to move things between different operations. And it's really important that when you think about that tax, I mean, you think about that synchronized approach, it's something which really can give you a lot of power because you can improve individual items and then see the benefit at the end. And what you get is the car rolling off the production line at the end. So that's very much delivering large mass production. What do we do when we look at somebody like Morgan Cars? Now, Morgan Cars, very different scenario. Morgan Cars at one point had a, an order book that lasted for 10 years. Great concept of, yeah, you've got an order book that's for 10 years. So 10 years, so what's your tack time? Well, their tack time really was that they delivered one or two cars a week. That was their tack time. They also had a number of other challenges. 
and we're just going to watch a short video here just to draw out some of those challenges. Uh, um, yeah, the main changes are that we now take 17 days on average to build a car yeah. when it was 48. That's right. And the other thing is that you'll see half the work in progress that you saw before. So, whereas yeah, before you saw nearly 100 cars, right. yeah. well, of course, we put it back in the factory. Yeah. So that enabled us to build the water-based paint shop. Yeah. Um, that also enabled us to sort out the layout. This is looking much more like a, a production line. So what you heard there was Sir John Harvey Jones in a program called The Troubleshooter. It's a few years old now. It's up on YouTube, and I, I strongly suggest if anybody's interested, go and watch both the original program from 1989 and the catch-up in 2000, where he introduced some of those concepts. You heard in that video clip, 48 days to produce a car. So what that meant was they had cars sitting in their workshop for 48 days. What does that actually mean? It means that they had assets that were locked down. They had space that was used up. They couldn't actually do anything any quicker. They implemented a number of changes. Those changes were all about continuous improvement. They looked at the, the order in which they built the cars. They looked at how they progressed through the factory. They looked at having how they had the parts. One of the big changes was they went from cutting things out with hand snips to actually using mechanized cutters. They brought that tack time down from 48 days to 17. Imagine what that does if you apply that to any process where you reduce the time that it takes from start to finish by over 50%. An impressive thing in that respect. But you don't just think about things like that. You also think about simplicity. Now, many of you will be familiar with the London tube map. And you look at this and you think, yeah, I understand my way around London. Could you navigate your way around London and the outskirts based upon that map? Mm, probably not. Let's look at what that tube map looks like if you put it on an ordinary map but it's not understandable. So one of the key things for a business analyst, especially in an agile, is to be able to take the complex and make it simpler, but not just as a one-off issue, doing it a second time, look at, can you refresh the ship? But this model, this model which was invented by Harry Beck, has been used and adopted and adapted for so many things. Here's one of the lakeside fells. So anybody who wants to go to the lakes, there's a tubular fells map using that style. Anybody want to go and, and actually climb a few mountains based on that map? I suspect not. I suspect you're going to use more like this sort of map. And again, it's about that communication and getting that message across and doing it right. So I've run through a lot of things there and I've run through a lot of examples and I've given you some things. So let's now drill down into some real observations of reality. So how does it be a grow in an agile world? Right, well, I could talk about any industry, but rather than talking about one industry or a specific industry, I'm going to use the growth. I'm going to talk about the concept of growing plants. So how does a, a, a BA grow in an agile world? Well, they can identify the right things to grow. They can identify the best growing conditions. They can understand the different impacts. They can communicate with the gardeners, the harvesters, and everybody else. And they'll maybe work on some trial sites and some little tests. And hopefully they'll get a flourishing result. So let's now think about how does that actually come when we actually think about different types of agile teams. So many organizations that adopt agile are small, they work on a single product line, they have a single team, and the BA basically is just part of that team, and they all work together in a, in a greenhouse. And that team lives and works in that greenhouse space. Um, and that's great, but then organizations tend to grow, and that single product line suddenly has multiple teams working on it. So does your BA work in each individual greenhouse? Do you have a BA in each greenhouse? Different organizations choose different solutions and they would work closely with the product owner across that. What happens when you start to move to multiple product lines? You start to see specialisms. Now, initially they might be really simple. They might be very complementary skills and your business analyst might understand different parts of the business. But what happens when they start to ask you to grow wheat as opposed to vegetables and flowers? And what happens when some kind of person brings in a, a herd of sheep? You've got to think about a business analyst is key and close to that business. If you're delivering different product lines, is the skill set of that business analyst transferable? Is it realistic to expect one business analyst or one product owner to share the knowledge across that whole set of product lines? 
And again, we're going to do a little reaction now. So I want to think about for your organization and those of you who are on the old version of Zoom, I'm sorry, you only have the first two options uh, on your choice. Um, so feel free to stick it in the chat if you can't react. Clap if you work in a single product, single team. Thumbs up for single product, multiple teams. Heart for the multi product, multiple teams. Try in for anything else where I haven't covered your scenario. So I'm seeing a few people single products. <laughs> Andrew's into the uh, something, some other approach, and several people are in multiple product, multiple team. Great, that's exactly what I would expect. A, team, a group like this, there's going to be a set of different expectations and different experiences. But what they all have in common are ways of working and the way, the way of working. You have product owners. Product owners are the key to the business. They, they understand what is going to be delivered for that business. And the business analyst should really, really work closely with them and be almost like their, their partner. The two together, the product owner and the business analyst, really key to understanding and communicating those business requirements. You saw the presentation last month. I can't go any better than that on talking about the product owner. Those who didn't attend last month, go and watch the recording. Definitely worth it. So now let's think about what this product owner and this business analyst do together. Well, first of all, they need to understand the, the needs of the business stakeholders and they need to understand what they actually require. And with that, they need to share that information broadly with the team to make sure that the team that is going to deliver knows what they're going to deliver. So let's ask the question for those who are working in Agile, how is your relationship to the product owner? Heart for those people who feel that they're working really closely together. Here's for anybody who feels it could be better. And a few reactions there, several hearts and a couple of tears. And you know what? Again, organizations are not yet mature in the way in which they've built that relationship with their product owner. How do they work together? How have they mastered the differences between the business analyst and the product owner? Where does the boundary sit? And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start to drill down into some of those things you can do to work better together, product owner with a business analyst. So let's start by thinking about the different agile activities. We're going to start off at a very practical level, capturing the things that need to be done. Starting with the product owner, identifying and capturing the list of stories. Once you've got those stories, prioritizing them, working out your dependencies, ranking them, making sure that you have the knowledge and understanding. Going into sprint planning making sure that those dependencies and that the team fully understand the interactions of those different stories. However, during stand-up and the rest of the day, to be brutally honest, making sure that somebody from that duo, the PA and the PO, is there to answer the questions and respond when people have, pop, have a question in the team. You don't just do it then. Throughout this, you're going to be looking at delivering quality. You're going to be assisting in the testing, making sure that the actual requirements specified up front by the stakeholders are the ones that are being delivered. And if you get all of that, you get to launch some great product. Notice it's not software, notice it's not hardware, it's any product. And what you do is you take that product and you get immediate feedback. VAs, product owners, that feedback is really important because you put that back into the process to build the next iteration bigger, better, etc because you've taken that feedback into account so let's just have a brief recap at the start of this i said here's what the business analyst requirements are what they do and here's the agile principles and we've seen all of those come together now all of that sounds wonderful doesn't it everybody's going yeah i can sign up to all of that i we we do that that's wonderful we all know what it is it's all brilliant yeah, okay. Now let's talk a little bit about reality. Let's talk about some of the anti patterns that I see. And I'll give you a few things here in that respect. So, anti patterns are where somebody says they're doing agile, but the bit, what you can actually see in terms of their behavior, they're not fully adopting that agile approach. Let's start off with the, the, one, the killer one. We have to have a perfect set of signed off requirements documents before the project can commence. 
Yeah, definitely an anti-pattern. If you're signing off a full set of requirements documents before you started, you're, you're back in the land of waterfall where everything has to be up front, everything is a stage game. Make sure you think about that. Having that perfect signed off requirements document and not allowing change is going to re restrict your ability to change. It's going to restrict that ability to embrace change and adapt to the information that is available to build a better product. The second anti-pattern is all the team members work in isolation. Headsets on, no interaction. This is made a hundred times worse, a thousand times worse by everything that's happened with COVID where everybody is working from home. It just encourages that I work on my own, I deliver my bit, I don't interact. So one of the key things that agile teams have really got to work on at the moment is how do you build that collaborative working together experience when you're in a time of COVID? Some organizations that I've seen have been really successful is that they have the concept of work together but apart, which is that they have a Zoom meeting that is open. They have the cameras on, but they have it, the mics off. Everybody's just getting on with their thing, but they're sat in a virtual office space on Zoom. And that just encourages that we're working together but apart. Because if somebody has a problem, they can come off mute and they can ask the group. Now, some organizations do that for the whole day, which I think would scare me witless, to be brutally honest. But I get that some organizations having a, a two hour period in the morning or a two hour period in the afternoon where they come together but work apart, it really does build that team relationship. And that's a great way of working in Agile. Another anti pattern is we have to have the complete backlog. We can't start until we have everything in the backlog. We can't get going. We've got to list everything. Again, it, it talks back to that. How much do you need to know? What do you need to know to move on to the next stage? What do you need to be planning for in the future? Certainly, you need a high level vision. And one of the things that I like to do is talk about horizons of vision. What do I have to do today? What do I have to do this week? What's this month? What's this year? And think about that in that respect. Um, so really interesting in that respect. Backlogs written as tasks, not stories. Again, it comes back, and this is something that BAs can very directly impact, is don't think of writing it as we are going to do X. Write what the problem is that you're solving. As a user, I want to so that. Use that framework. It's, it works. It helps you in that respect. Oh, this is the one that I see so often. Teams working away on a story, whatever that story might be, and somebody suddenly finds, well, you know what, we could do this and make it so much better. And they go, oh, that's really good. Let's put that onto this story. And then somebody else comes along with an idea. And before you know it, this small activity that was part of the sprint has become not only this sprint, but the next sprint as well, because that scope has been grown and creeped within that sprint. And that's a, an anti-pattern of people trying to be too agile and try to take change in too often. So it's a really good one. And the final one is, it's more of an expectation change. It's not really an anti-pattern as such, although you will see this as an anti-pattern with management and senior leaders, where they expect to get value at the end. They don't understand the, the benefits of value throughout the process. And so deliver early, iterate, improve, is a definite step in, anti, in business analyst. So how do we avoid these anti-patterns? So many of you will be familiar with the five whys approach. And give me a quick thumbs up if you've heard of five whys for root cause resolution. Don't worry if you haven't, I'm gonna talk through something related to it. I just wanna get a feel for, right. So what I'm going to introduce to you today is my five what's, okay? What is the value? So you're asking me to do something or you're suggesting that we do something as a team. What is the value that this is going to deliver? What does the full backlog give us in terms of value? What does the perfect signed off requirements give? Is it a tick on a, a PM's Gantt chart? Or is it actually helpful to deliver usable benefits to the end customer? What is it going to cost to do this? Is the cost that it's going to produce going to change? Is it a cost to us in terms of something which will save us money later on? Or is it actually a cost that we'll bear up front and it'll then become a sunk cost even if we never deliver this in the end? What is the impact 
will this lead to a better end product? Is it something which will actually make us deliver a better product at the end? Is it something that as BAs, we can genuinely say, here we go, this is something which will actually give us a better impact. But what risk? So the opposite side to the coin of impact is to think about risk. If we don't do this, what risk do we leave our product, our project in? And how are we going to factor that in? And what are we going to do to make sure that we mitigate that risk? Could the absence of this require us to do lots of refactoring in the future is a really good example of something where you need to think about the, what the risk. And the fifth one is, what about change? What happens if something changes in the future? Can we cater for it? Can we cope with it? Can we evolve with it? And that's what I'd like to leave you with today is think about it as the ability to change. You spend the time, you spend the effort, you consider the future impact or risk, and you make sure you don't waste your change. Last weekend, I came across an absolute killer video that absolutely cracked me up. I'm going to watch that now, which was just about the importance of user feedback to any process. And here we're going to see the tester watching an end user test the final solution. This is a square. Can you guess which spot that goes the in? The square. That's right. It goes in the square hole. Yes. Okay. And how about this rectangle? That one? Also the square. That goes in there too. Yeah. Up next, we've got this thin rectangle. The thin rectangle. Can you guess where that goes? The thin rectangle. That's right. It goes in the square hole. And up next, a cylinder. Hmm. The circle. I think that goes in the circle. The square hole. Now, we've also got this semicircle right here. Do you see a slot that would fit the, the semicircle? Semicircle? The, sem the semicircle. That's right, it's the square hole. Okay, up next, the triangle. We know what hole that goes the into, triangle. right? Triangle. That's right, the square hole. And up, la up next, we have the arch. The arch. The arch. And you guessed it. The arch. It goes in the square oh, hole. God. Now, that's maybe a little bit extreme um, in terms, but it's so important. What you see there is if you'd had the early user feedback of when you built the first two holes and got that in, what a different experience that would have. So that's it. I haven't given you the answer to the ultimate question of life. I haven't told you the universe and everything. What I would say is everybody knows that it's 42, so I don't need to tell you that. You don't need to panic. There's lots of things out there, and I now hand over to all of the questions that have come through. And I see there's one from Taz on my screen, so I'll pick that one up first because it's visible. But if there are other ones higher up, I'm sure Alan or Monique will point them out to you. So, in how we've been pretty pretty quiet on the question front, um, but uh, we'll we'll take questions from people uh, on their uh, on their mics. I think is probably the best idea. But carry on. Absolutely. Yep. So Taz has asked, how do you avoid anti-patterns? What level of information do you think is feasible for a BA to gather if they're working a few sprints ahead? Absolutely brilliant question. So let's start and go back to what I said about the different horizons. So the information for the current sprint has to be enough information that the team are not going to be continuously interrupting to, to get further details and further information. For the next sprint, you want to have sufficient information that they can actually estimate, they can identify dependencies, and you want to make sure that the next sprint out, you've got enough information that they can properly sprint plan when they get to that time, they can do proper estimation. The sprint beyond that, you want to be knowing what the stories are, you want to have a, a flavour for what's coming, and so that they can identify dependencies, etc. Once you get beyond that sprint, you're looking at things that are going to go into the backlog. And what you're doing is you're doing that continuous refinement of what do I need now, next, after that, and the future? And just keep working like that and build that refinement out. And don't be scared of going back and fixing something that you've already done. Does that help, Taz? Anything else you want to pick up on that? Yeah, that, that's, that's useful, definitely. But um, can, more specifically, if, we, if you go back a couple of slides, you had um, some questions on the anti patterns, you know, like what's the cost or how to avoid anti patterns? Yep. You said, you know, what's the cost? What's the impact? a risk so for those kind of questions do you how feasible well what level of information is it feasible to, is feasible to actually gather 
if you're kind of you know maybe grooming a story like can you maybe you can give us an example perhaps of yeah, yeah. what level of detail you'd expect and, and i would also say to anybody else who's in the room who feels they've got a valid experience they want to share feel free to jump in in that respect i'm i'm not standing up here and saying i'm the, the guru who can answer everything we have the collective knowledge we have the deep thought all of you folks who are here today feel free to chime in so but i will give my example and then i'll open the floor to anybody else so if you're thinking about collecting the stories for future speaks, okay let's think about these five questions so what value does that story have is it something we're definitely committed to doing because if it's not definitely committed it's not something which has been prioritized it's not something which has been um sized and ranked and planned the value of writing a hugely detailed storyline is minimal at that point in time but when you come to each of those stages in the agile process of ranking it you need more information estimating you need more information putting it into the actual sprint and committing to deliver you need more information and so you almost need to compartmentalize your process into how much do i need to capture now again go back to that manufacturing use the just-in-time principle of capture enough to deal with what the requirement is at that stage in the process for what's happening to that particular story if it's just a it's listed on the backlog a title may be all you need that might be all you need to be able to put it on the backlog it might be that you need more detail when you come to estimation it's definitely going to need to be more fully documented when you come to committing to deliver but like i said the what cost if I don't define the detail of this, let's say, for example, that I'm looking at an integration between two systems, I may need to specify in great detail what that integration looks like and get agreement with that partner. So therefore, you've got an, an objective there where you want to make sure that you deliver it in that respect, because the impact of not doing that is huge because you could get to the point where, yeah, we're going to build this integration and everybody sits down and goes, OK, so what are we building? What is it? Oh, we can't do that. So there are times when you need to do that. Um, yeah. Um, what What's the risk? Um, facing that question and saying, OK, you're asking me to write a thousand stories now. What's the risk that me not writing this particular story is going to cause us problems later? Not putting the detail in. Think about it from that respect. And the, the big question to feed back into that process is, you're saying to me write everything now and i'm saying to you how am i going to handle change how do we actively support change because change is going to happen you're going to get feedback you're going to get changes that come in completely left field how many people here had any thought that this time last year they were going to be looking at working up from home for a year i didn't i work from home anyhow so it made no difference to me but many people out there it was a huge shock to them so think about that just play those questions back that I've given when people are asking you to do something. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying be aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it and what it's bringing to you in that respect. I think that's a, a really good point, Phil. And, um, you know, going back to the example there of anti-patterns in terms of, you know, making sure we've got a complete backlog. You know, you can look at this, uh, you know, what value is it me giving you uh, a completed story that is sitting on that backlog that might not actually be prioritized to be built. Uh, you know, so it's about making sure that you're, you're concentrating on what you have to deliver. And I think, you know, Phil's point about those horizons is actually the stuff at the top of the backlog that you're, you're preparing and are going to fill into, you know, your, your, your fairly recent or, or fairly close sprints. You do need to make sure that you've got you know, those fully formed. But as it kind of gets down to the bottom of the, the backlog, you know, again, Phil's comment there that just the title, you know, should be enough for people to understand what that is. Uh, and, you know, they, they may drop out because there's a change that you haven't, you know, haven't uh, anticipated or you get some feedback from a demo and actually those that, that thing at the bottom needs to come up. So you need to look at, you know, refining that. So it is keeping an eye on what you're trying to deliver uh, and, and what is, 
you know, an appropriate level of detail and, and looking at that, what risk, what impact, what cost, what value, come back to that value again, you know, what is the value of me doing this right now, as opposed to what maybe I should be doing, you know, and is this supporting our, our, our sprint and delivering what we've said we're going to deliver? If it's not, then it has, you know, that's the impact that maybe we're not going to deliver. Should I be um, spending time on this? Someone has to make a priority call on that. And, you know, perhaps that's something that you, you pull your product uh, manager to the side and say, look, I'm not sure about this, but just speak up. You know, one of the great things about agile teams should be that everyone's uh, contribution is, is worthwhile. So don't be afraid to stand up and, and you know, say, I'm, I'm not sure about this. Constructive disagreement, <laughs> where you, you, you discuss, you disagree, but you do it in a constructive way. So it's not beating people up and having that psychological safety to be able to disagree and share that. Um, I'll, I'll share a little experience that I had. I was working with one of the games companies up in Liverpool who build multiplayer games, console games, if you like, from a third party shooter. And they explained to me how they, how they do the graphics. And the graphics has all these parallels with that horizon. So the things that are close to you, they go into great detail and they make sure that the, the hoodie has the pre-suit and the reflections and the shadows and everything is right. The things that are slightly further away, they, they maybe use just block colors. And then the things that are way in the distance, they just give a real outline sketch. But your brain processes it as a completely immersive experience. But the detail of the things in the distance are very poor, but you know it's there. You know that there's a guy about to shoot you from 100 meters away. But only when you get up close do you actually see the detail. And they only build that detail as it's required. Because again, it's exactly the same principle. They have a limited amount of processing capacity. And so they don't do everything to the nth level of degree, the 4K. They deal with the things that you can see close in great detail, and then it gets less the further away you are. And that rendering process, very similar to managing your backlog. Good way of uh, thinking about it, I think. Yeah. As, as things come closer, you need more detail. Yeah, and I think I've kind of a, I know there's another question from from, from Hina um just a, I think I have a, a wrap up on on this one kind of, and I, because that triggers our thoughts kind of an experience as well so I put a link in the the chat so we we got a past event about like user stories what would be the level of details that we, we should be writing um I think it's a very good kind of event if you you are interested in knowing what should be put in a user story. And I hope that that would uh, be useful for our, our audience today. I think there's another thought. Um, that's kind of a project experience as well. So, um, and I, I was actually not on that project, but I'm doing kind of, an, kind of some oversight of how, how things went. So it's really interesting to see uh, what, and, and to communicate with the delivery team, um, technical guys on what exactly they would use our user stories for because I think there would be a level that we capture in a user story about the benefits, like why we are building this feature. So I think that's one level just to, to provide that context. But I think actually when speaking to uh, developers and testers, understand how they use the, the user stories is helpful because actually some of them, they, they may expect VAs to help out in providing some of the kind of so-called use cases or how more technical user stories on how things should be developed just to provide more, more pointers. So really kind of work with them on the level of details that they would expect from us as business analysts. I think that's uh, it's always kind of a good starting point. And then you can do kind of, a re kind of a reverse engineering to understand, okay, at what sprint I should be doing what, and also kind of what would be what information will be available to me to provide that level of details? I think that's how how I would approach it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really a good advice. You know, working with your developers, you know, you're part of the team, uh, and successfully delivering that, you know, piece of work relies on everyone understanding what needs to be done. Um, you know, 
certainly in the past we've used um, acceptance criteria um, extensively and that helps not only ex explain what you think should happen with that story but also helps you kind of formulate what what you're trying to achieve so um, you know definitely talk 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 is, is probably the advice yeah um, there is another question which is around managing too much change um, especially increasing the scope of the current story versus being agile very simple if if the scope change can be covered in the time and the complexity that you've estimated for the current sprint and it makes no difference to the current sprint it's just a different way of doing something um, I'd hopefully we're going to say a better way of doing something but <laughs> let's go with different uh, because there are times then go for it do it in the current sprint um, if it's something which is going to require rework or refactoring, don't be scared of pulling the item out of the current sprint and reconsidering what it is you're actually trying to deliver. Be agile. Only do what you know and what is right in that respect. Um, very much take that, bring it out. If it can be done and it has no impact upon the sprint, stick it in the current sprint. If it's going to have an impact, get it on the backlog and, and assess it against all the other requirements outside. Don't just take keep it, sorry, don't just keep taking things into the current sprint because you can, because there lands, lies a land of pain and you end up in that completely unsustainable. We're always doing an all nighter at the end of every sprint to deliver everything that we've suddenly got. And review your velocity. As a team, re review what you've actually managed to deliver versus what you committed to and adjust it down and adjust the expectations. Don't say, we'll do better next sprint. We can always do more. Think about, be realistic, be honest, have that position of psychological safety that you can say, we took too much on and stop. I think we've dried up all the questions. Oh dear. I think we have. Actually, so, like uh, on that point, right? Like, um, sorry, uh, one quick question. Uh, when you say like, okay, don't try to say that like next time, like you will do better and like do more, right? So, but people tend to push like, especially the project managers and like your superiors tries to push like, okay, so you have the requirements like, okay, do the workshop in just one day and then like do the requirements in one day. So two days is good enough for a small requirement. So, but like as a BA, we know that, right? Like it's not, it, it never happens that like all the needed participants will be available for the same workshop. It will be like multiple workshops that we need to conduct and like get all the details that is needed. And once we get like we need to put our thought process like how they are logically tied together, how to test them and then like kind of thing, isn't it? When we document it, it's not just like writing a minutes of meeting what has been discussed. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So how do you how, how do we convince our team saying like, OK, no, that's not how we are working and B A needs more time to invest. OK. First thing, encourage that psychological safety. Don't think of it as how do I, it's how do we. So you have to build that team relationship so that collectively you all have that shared understanding of you're committing to deliver together. That's the whole point of the sprint commitment. So if one of you is feeling that you're under pressure, it's not you on your own, it's the team. And I know that sounds a little bit glib and I apologize for that. But it is very important that you actually take that concept of collectively as a team, you're committing to deliver. So if you as the business analyst in that team are saying, hang on a minute, we need to think about more about our acceptance criteria. We need to think about the interactions and inter integrations. That should be ringing alarm bells in just the same way as a developer standing up and saying, oh, we can't do that because the database doesn't work. It needs more indexing. It needs more, more power. We need to have... Um, a greater level of visibility of this or that. Very much don't think of it as a BA standing in isolation. A BA is a part of that team and is a crucial part of that team and collectively you've committed to deliver it. And if anybody raises a flag, it doesn't matter who or for what reason, it's a flag to the team that this is a problem for the team, not a flag for the individual. And that's definitely one of the key things that I'd say for any organisation adopts Agile. It's Teams make commitments, not individuals. Individuals commit to supporting the team. They don't commit to their own particular set of deliveries. And that's another anti-pattern I could have put down, which is the, the 
the start of the sprint, every task is allocated off the sprint to an individual. There's nothing left unallocated. There's nothing that's there. And that would help in that respect. So think about your sprint commitment. It's a team that commits to that sprint. It's a team that delivers. An anti-pattern is everybody has their tasks. Nobody helps anybody with any task. You're just using a queue system. It's not an agile approach. Now, I've got to prompt people to fill in the, the, the poll. Um, so that's there. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to do a very quick plug for Adaptivist. We're a global consultancy, particularly focused on DevOps, Atlassian tooling, GitLab, and, ba and various other stuff. Thank you very much for taking the time. If you're interested in joining us, we're recruiting like mad. One thing COVID hasn't done is stop us from recruiting, and we'd love to have you join. And I've got to do my final acknowledgements. Lots of the icons and stuff came from flaticon.com. Hopefully you found my talk beneficial. Feel free to reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn. Thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you, Monique and Alan, for inviting me. Thank you, Phil. Um, really good talk. I think there are lots, lots and lots of really useful insight there. You know, I think we we kind of get a bit siloed as BAs and, and you know, just get pushed along. So I think recognizing anti-patterns and getting some tools to help us um, deal with those and just making ourselves have that courage to, uh, to stand up and be counted is probably the, the best things we can take out of this. Yeah, so that's thank you very much. I hope everyone found that useful. Great, thank you, thank you for you. Um, a final, final, final thing um, before we go. So we, we always have looked for volunteers to, to help out in organizing events. And if you are interested in presenting of your just to share your project experience with the community here. Um, do do let us know. We always would love to to hear about your your story. Yeah, and and as kind of, uh, we we mentioned at the start, uh, follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter. Do have kind of spread the words, repost. Um, every post um, really matters to to us to to get uh, out to to more people out there. Yeah, so thank you very much for joining. And we'll see you next month at the next event. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.